This is Cadillac Unscripted on 107.9 CDY, and it's sponsored by Independent Bank. Very glad to have you here. It is another Saturday morning of local chat, and this is actually the second time that we have had Kate King on with us. She is the Wexford uh, County 4-H Program Coordinator, and she is here to talk about all things 4-H. Welcome, Katie Kate. Katie is uh, my co-host, and I've got Katie and Kate here today. We do. Kate King is somebody who knows her programs, and she's passionate about them. So I love interviewing, interviewing Kate because uh, you don't even have to give her questions ahead of time because she's excited about about what she does and she's so knowledgeable so welcome thank you so much I'm glad to be here again so the last time we talked to you you had new programs that you were implementing how's that piece of 4-H going oh we are up and running full force now um, after the pandemic um, we actually just launched two clubs this last week um, after the new year um, so we have a new archery club that's for beginners filled up super fast we had capped it at 10 and we've got 14 kids in there some of them coming from fife lake even no kidding um, yep and then we started um, working with st anne's this week as well we're doing an after school program that's filling that gap of that really popular robotics club that we saw in the cadillac news mm -hmm. so we're having fun there too Awesome. Um, you mentioned at one point that you need more volunteers. How's your volunteer base? Um, we've gotten a couple more since the last time we talked. It's almost been a year now, I think, since the last time we talked. Um, so I've gotten a couple new volunteers. They're young, which is great, um, but we still always need more. We need okay. more, 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 because the more volunteers we have, the more we can offer to the community and to our youth. You know, Kate, we interviewed Dr. Jim Whalen, um, who's a med medical director with Munson Hospital locally, and um, Jim explained for mental health and resiliency that um, one of his bullet points, and, and he could back it up with research, is the importance of interpersonal relationships and communication. And I think 4-H provides that. Can you tell us? Oh, absolutely. So in 4-H, we're all about hands-on learning. And our H's all stand for something. So we have head, heart, hands, and health. And those all break out into different life skills that we develop. Those interpersonal skills are very important. That's how you learn conflict resolution. It's how you learn how to get along with your coworkers when you're an adult. It's how you manage interacting with the public when you're in a public service position. All of those skills are huge. And by allowing kids to have a space where they're safe to be themselves and to learn and grow without the structure and regimen of classrooms, it really gives them the opportunity to learn those skills at their own pace in their own way through hands-on learning and a fun club with other kids that are interested in the same thing. Those skills cannot be taught to a kid who sits on the couch all day with their phone in their hand. Mm -hmm. No. Mm -hmm. And those skills, you're also not learning while you're playing video games. You might a little bit, but those video game communities can get very toxic. It's the exact opposite of the skills that we need our kids to learn. They're learning how to be confrontational, how to bully each other, and how to be mean and in a fun, spirited way, quote, unquote, um, mm -hmm. So through our clubs, we learn about competition and different things like archery, um, but through a safe environment where we're teaching them how to interact in appropriate ways mm -hmm. and how to learn to get their frustrations and anger and different things out in safe, healthy ways, just like the doctor was talking about. So, Kate, you know, for old folks like Rich and I, 4-H <laughs> <laughs> uh, to me, um, it's evolved into absolutely a much larger thing so I can remember going to the county fair and it was who got the ribbon for mm -hmm. the cow and the rabbit and the pig and the pie and the jelly and the yep. quilt can you tell I mean it's, now it's that and more absolutely so those are our roots we started out um, as a way for land-grant universities to get research into the communities. So that's what MSU Extension does through Michigan, Michigan State University. We are the local branch in every county that helps convey the information that's coming out of the research. So when 4-H started, it was a way to educate the youth because the adults didn't really want to listen. They knew <laughs> what they did. They had their traditions and they did their thing. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where we started in that agricultural sphere was educating the farmers through their own children who were in the fields with them. 
And then as that developed, it turned into learning how to raise the animals themselves, learning all the finances and the health side of it, the animal science, the veterinary science, all of that that goes with raising an animal. Because it's not just throwing the pig slop anymore. It's making sure that they're getting their protein and all the other nutrients that they need in order to produce the best animal, whether that animal is a pet or whether it is a livestock animal and it's going to be auctioned off at the fair. So beyond that, we have things that cover everything. And we're really a see a need, fill a need kind of organization. Mm -hmm. The clubs that are offered in Metro Detroit are different than the clubs that are offered here in Wexford County. And that's because we have different needs. Sure. So when we're having an archery club here, it's because we have a lot of outdoor enthusiasts who have all of this great land that they can go and explore through their archery or whatever other skills they're learning with us. But down in Detroit, they've got, um, you know, programs that are sponsored through Apple and they're learning the technology and different things like that. So it's really diverse and kids can also participate across county lines so if they want to if they've got you know split parents where one's down in Grand Rapids and one's up here they're spending their summer down in Grand Rapids they can do clubs down in Grand Rapids and then do other clubs here with us when they're home Mm -hmm. so when you're when you're talking about because Katie brought this up you know when when we were growing up it was 4-H was all about agriculture and it was about the fair and it was about animals and and, in growing things and that kind of thing but the programming at 4-H the modern day programming at 4-H is surprising for a lot of people and that's part of the reason why we wanted to have you in here is because there's so many programs that 4-H offers that would be surprising to people. Give us some examples of some of the programs that people would say, oh, I didn't know 4-H does that. Mm -hmm. One of our um, popular ones that I've done twice now is babysitting. Oh, And that one is so fun. Um, I just did one um, before the holidays with the new CAPS crew here in Cadillac. That's their new after-school program. Um, and we had, I think, 17 kids um, from the middle school, Mac Trail Middle School, um, that were there for four days with us after school for around an hour, hour and 20 minutes. They get a snack after school that's provided by the program. And then we sat down and we learned all of the ins and outs of babysitting, from personal safety to kitchen safety to how to market yourself as an entrepreneur and how to take care of youth from infants to middle schoolers because a lot of them are babysitting their younger siblings. Mm -hmm. So that's the perfect class for them to learn those skills. But then we like to take those youth and try to get them into other different types of clubs as well. So they might start out with the babysitting club that's offered after school, and then maybe we have interest in pet sitting. So that's something I like to offer as a way to start into the babysitting, but um, maybe we need to have a pet sitting club that talks about um, how to train different animals and how to be safe around animals. So we can you know, combine different things to what the youth are asking for. But babysitting is one of the fun ones that we do for sure that people don't realize that it comes from us. A lot of times right. they reach out to the Child Protective Council or um, some of the other you know, youth-related organizations looking for babysitting and it always comes back to us and I love that that's us yes that I mean I would never have would you have ever guessed that 4-H had a babysitting class Mm, uh, nope not not until now and uh, all all of you parents of of youngsters out there uh, be looking for for the next one Absolutely. And all of all of you parents that have small children, um, Kate's got kids that know what they're doing. I'll never forget when when my youngest was babysitting one afternoon, she was babysitting um, for a family that had livestock and they had everything. They had the Mm -hmm. Shetland ponies, the big ponies, the big horses, the, the cows, the chickens. And, and she was not raised um, on a farm, my daughter. Right. And she told me later that the baby needed a diaper change. And as and, and it was a serious diaper change the baby needed. <laughs> and as she looked out the window, the horse had gotten out of the, the fencing. Yep. And oh so my. she had a decision to make right there, you right. know, at, at, you know, 14. And so she 
change the baby, you know, change the baby. And then she went out, you know, with the baby and got the horse back in. And she mm-hmm. said, you know, what do you think? And I said, I, I think you nailed it. <laughs> but I wouldn't have known, Kate, what to do right. in that situation. And that's some of the things we do in our babysitting workshop is we have scenario questions sure. that we pose. And then we go around and what would you do? And we start those out at the beginning so that we're learning, you know, what are some of the scenarios you might come across? So they're in your mind as we're going through the lessons over that week. And then when you get to the end, you're like, what would you do in this scenario? And they've all got it down pat. Wow. The funniest thing, though, is I have two um, weighted babies that you can, like, put the batteries in and they cry and all of that kind of stuff. I don't keep the batteries in there. Um, <laughs> but they're anatomically correct, and I have a boy and girl. So usually my babysitting classes are mostly female identifying students. Right. So then you have the, the boy diaper change coming up and you have to explain you know, yep. how to properly clean the diaper mm-hmm. area mm-hmm. and that you wipe from front to back and all of those different mm-hmm. hygiene things. Yeah, absolutely. And explaining how to clean all of that is yeah. always got some nice looks on their face. <laughs> right, right. You're, you're in an area that maybe they know nothing about, but right. they, want it, they want to get it right. Yeah, and then we also have to keep in mind that everybody comes from different places. Mm-hmm. Some kids ask at 12 are not yet in tune with what happens as adults or where babies come Mm. from and all of those different things so you have to tread lightly there Mm -hmm. and you also have to remind them that if they don't understand what you're saying right now they might want to talk to their parents before they take their first job Mm -hmm. or different things like that so we always advocate for open communication with adults and youth um, because they can't learn those communication skills on their own Mm -hmm. so having those hard conversations or might be difficult for different people Mm -hmm. um, talking about those subjects, which usually comes from the way their parents handled those subjects. So there's all kinds of things that we come across in our clubs. I'll bet. It sounds to me, though, like the skill sets that you're developing for these folks are life skills. Yep, that's exactly what we do. Okay, so we've got babysitting, we've got archery, we've got the egg piece. Mm -hmm. What are some other programs? Our other really popular club is our Wild Ones Club, which does outdoor recreation. So we meet at the Carl T. Johnson Center. We'll be doing one of their snowshoe hikes coming up soon um, next week. And um, so right now I've got it set up that we do one meeting on a Wednesday evening and we learn something cool about owls or about how animal feet work, which is what we did right before um, the holiday. We learned about different types of animal feet and how horses have like one big toe and then um, how rabbits have bigger feet in the back to help them um, not fall through the snow and different things like that. And they learned about animal tracks and how you can follow them and um, if the tracks are wide apart part they might have been running from something all of that kind of stuff and then we're going to do our snowshoe hike and maybe look for tracks so we're going to do our um, normal meeting where we're learning and having hands-on fun and then we're going to have an adventure meeting mm-hmm. um, where we go out and do something related to that so oh boy you know one of the issues um, that we have with our young people is not enough time outside in yes. fresh air and not enough exercise and yep. not an, not enough time off the screen and yep. it sounds like you you didn't even really mean to, but you're you're addressing those issues yes, as part those of your are, programs. You know, those are personal issues for me. I'm a huge couch potato. I don't leave my house. <laughs> I would have never guessed that based no, on no. the last 15 minutes right, we've no, been talking right. here. Yeah. Um, I don't leave my house unless I have to. I'm a, a very homebody. That's how my partner and I operate. Uh-huh. Um, but I also recognize the importance of teaching kids to get off the couch sure. um, because I didn't necessarily do that when I was younger. Sure. Um, So through my studies, I studied environmental science and biology. Nobody would have ever guessed that. My mom always told me I was going to be a lawyer because I argued so well. (laughs) I love it. (laughs) So um, the fact that I went into science and then I went in, I worked with the DNR for two years before taking on this position Mm -hmm. through an AmeriCorps program. Um, So I was like out on the trails every day, um, you know, scouting for invasive species or different things like that, doing field work. Nobody would have ever guessed that came from me. So that's a personal thing for me is instilling the importance of nature, not only for, you know, 
human survival and the survival of our planet, but also for your emotional well-being and your physical well-being and all of that. You need to leave the house sometimes. You need to open those windows and get fresh air. Um, All of those different things are very important. And showing kids through an example, even though I'm a huge couch potato, I still get out there and I go on these hikes with them. I'm going to be in the back with a slow kid, (laughs) but that's okay (laughs) because they've got a friend back there with them. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. How do you decide what when you're going to implement a new program? Um, it really comes down to having the volunteers to support it. Okay. So through my position, I'm not supposed to be leading the clubs. I'm leading some of them now because we don't have the volunteer support and we really need programs going. Um, so when the pandemic happened, we had established clubs. They kind of fell apart a little bit over the pandemic. We couldn't meet because of regulations and things from our organization. Um, and through that, some of our volunteers have stepped away. Mm -hmm. So I have established clubs and I'm kind of filling the void of volunteers right now. And if I can get more volunteers in, then I can dedicate my time to developing new clubs and getting volunteers in place to run those clubs. Because when you take somebody off the street, like if you wanted to become a volunteer with us and you really don't have that much experience with 4-H and you have this notion in your head that 4-H is all about livestock and animals and the fair, then you feel like an outsider. You're, you're not in the right spot. Mm-hmm. But that's not true. It's okay. just about explaining what 4-H is and for the volunteer to understand how they can fit into that picture. And we really take the volunteer into consideration. If we've got a volunteer that's interested in doing crafts with the five to seven year olds, then heck yeah, we're going to do a craft club with five to seven year olds because what's more fun for kids than meeting once a week, twice a month, whatever it is, to just have a craft day with other kids where they get to get glue out and glitter and googly eyes and all that fun stuff. (laughs) And that's also teaching them fine motor skills. And Mm -hmm. there's always skills behind what we do. It's not just filling time so mom can go to Walmart by herself for the first time in three months. Mm -hmm. But it's something that gives those kids a place and something to look forward to. And I've got two kids there. I think they're five and six. They know that my car's name is Oliver. Every time they see a green car on the road, they think it's me. And they're yelling (laughs) for Miss Kate. So it's all about developing those relationships and giving them more positive influences in their life, too. Something to look forward to. Yeah, absolutely. Now, you uh, you were just mentioning programs before. So and, and you're always looking to identify needs in the community. Is there an area, is there a, a program that you would really like to implement, but you don't necessarily have the volunteers for it, but that is a needed program? Do you have any, any areas that you're kind of looking at saying, gosh, I wish we could offer this? Yeah, it's definitely that five to seven year range. Um, so in 4-H, those youth are referred to as clover buds because we've got our 4-H clover as our um, logo. Um, those youth, we focus on non-competitive programming. Um, so they participate in wild ones with us and do our outdoor activities. Um, but our archery club, because it's a competitive setting, um, we start them at eight years old there. Um, so that five to seven year range, we have so much interest Um, from new families who aren't familiar with 4-H, but they really don't want to have a chicken or a rabbit or any Mm -hmm. animal because that's just more work for them. You know, at five to seven, they're learning, but they're not doing it all. Mm -hmm. Um, So as a parent, that's taking on more work for you. Um, So finding someone who would be willing to host even once a month some type of craft club or something that's relating to that age range. And we have so much curriculum out there Um, because 4-H is in every state. Every state's developing their own curriculum. Um, We have a national curriculum. I have a book that's probably three inches wide of clover bud activities. And when I'm going to forest and farm daycare over the summer with their summer camp, I'm pulling activities out of that book and doing it with them. Or when I'm set up at the farmer's market over the summer, I have free activities for kids. We have hula hoop contests and all kinds of things that are age 
friendly for that age range because they're the ones that are coming up to you. They're like, mm-hmm. oh, I see a hula hoop. <laughs> the teenagers, they're not coming up to you. They're like, oh, there's that crazy lady with the hula hoops again. I'm not going to talk to her. So um, that age range is so interested and they just want to learn and play and grow. Mm-hmm. And that's what we're all about. Um, our other issue that we come across is not having the space to host clubs. Our office is located in Baker College now, so our office's hours are restricted to what the building hours are. So most days we can't have any programs past 5 o'clock. Right. So um, finding those community partners that are willing to help us by hosting clubs um, like the Carl T. Johnson Center hosting us. I've worked with the Cadillac Library for a babysitting club. Um, finding those spaces is also very difficult, especially when it comes to animal clubs. Sure. Um, finding heated spaces in winter that you can have chickens and rabbits in is a little difficult. So in addition to putting out a call for uh, possible new members of clubs, you're also kind of putting out a call here for people who have facilities that could host Yes. A, a club. Yes. And we're all about community partnerships because without our volunteers and our partners, we don't function. Um, so the Vet Serving Vets office um, at their new park, they've got a community room. Right. They're going to be hosting um, our animal clubs through the winter until we can get into the barns at the fairground. Excellent. Um, they use those barns for storage. So there's lots of boats in there right now. Um so we're always looking for those community partners that are willing to partner with us on those things. We're always giving back. Um, so whether it's writing thank you cards or helping to clean up the facility, our new archery club is being hosted at the Cadillac Sportsman's Club. We're super excited to have that partnership going. Um, they have an indoor shooting range, so we're not in a pole barn freezing our fingers off this year. Great. Um, so it's all about those community partnerships. And then we had probably three or four people asking us about different programs that the sportsman's club has going right now. Um, So by bringing these youth into this place, they're also getting, you know, benefits from it as well to boost their membership or their publicity or visibility in the community too. You know, some of these things that you're talking about, Kate, if a family had to hire, you know, a coach or a teacher or it would get expensive and, um, or, you know, an arch archery instructor, um, private lessons, that kind of thing. Um, I think you're really giving families an opportunity to help their children expand their horizon, learn about things that maybe they wouldn't have because it wasn't in the family interest book, if you will. And so, um, thank you so much for that because I, I, went for a walk recently in the woods and I cannot identify trees. I mean, that's very embarrassing. I mean, we live in one of the most beautiful places in the world, but I do not know a white pine from a red pine from a spruce (laughs) from a maple. And it's about time to learn that Mm -hmm. stuff. And that's the kind of stuff that you're doing. It's like, stop and look around. Yep. Just pause. I did um, a nature walk with that Wild Ones Club over the summer um, by the White Pine Trailhead on 44 Road. And um, I gave them a bingo card. So they had to find different things. And they're all about walking. And I'm like, you have to pause. Mm -hmm. Because you've already passed every single thing on this this bingo card. But you haven't stopped to smell the roses along the way. You're just trying to get from point A to point B. But it's about stopping and looking at things. One of the things on that was a hitchhiker seed. So those are like your burrs and the different seeds that stick to you. And we had a dog on the walk with us. So they let the dog walk into the little um, wildflower field and come back out. And he had a bunch of hitchhiker seeds on him. So we learned about how seeds travel along the way. Mm-hmm. Yep, it's all about stopping and smelling those roses for sure. Is Are the programs at no charge to your students or to your Yes. Members? So um, to join Michigan 4-H, there is no enrollment fee. It used to cost $20 per year per youth to do that. Um, during the pandemic, we eliminated that fee. 
Incredible. Um, now, if you are participating in an animal club and you're going to raise some um, chickens for the livestock auction, you would have to purchase those things and all of the feed and all of that that will go along with it. But in order to participate in our clubs, we don't have any clubs that are charging any fees right now. They may um, to help cover you know, art supplies or different things like that. Um, but we also have a really great leaders council um, who are either 4-H volunteers or parents or community members um, who help make the decisions for how we spend our funds Um, because we do sell plat books for Wexford County, which is our big fundraiser. I got a new one coming out very soon. I just got the the, um, approval form for it and everything. Um, Got the draft copy in the mail. So we'll have a new 2023 plat book coming out and all of those funds go into our leaders council fund. And then they help decide if we're going to, you know, have a big party at the end of the year and celebrate with awards or if we're going to go on a trip up to treetops and do some rope courses or um, if a club wants to, you know, um, build bird houses or something and we need those supplies Um, our leaders council is the one who helps grant those funds to us because we don't charge for participants to join the clubs anymore what a draw i mean you know one of the complaints that you'll hear from young people is you know i go to school and you know sometimes it's what do i need to know that for this is an opportunity for kids to pick something that they're interested in with their free time and do something healthy to better themselves, make them more independent, knowledgeable, and just better better people, I think. Yeah, and it's also a chance for them to dip their toes in it okay. and decide that's not my cup of tea, um, which is difficult when you have to pay, you know, $80 for six weeks of dance lessons or something like that. <laughs> and then they get in there and they hate every minute of it. And are you going to just bite the bullet and take the $80 hit? Or are you going to force them to do something that they've decided they're already not going to do? Okay, I'm howling because you forgot about <laughs> dance costumes. You oh, got to add that to Yeah, the I wasn't a dancer. <laughs> yeah, no. I, I was the soccer player. So it was the cleats and the shin guards and all of that kind of stuff. So yeah, yeah. Um, it can definitely add up and with 4-H we really try to mediate that cost because cost and transportation are two of the biggest barriers for participation for us. Right and and we know about the median income of Wexford County. Right. You know we know the challenges that we're at so to be able to give parents and families these opportunities it's 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 gold what you're doing. Very Absolutely. important. Yes. Um, if you could this is my favorite question for nonprofits. <laughs> if you could add any program you had all the money all the volunteers, what would it be? I'm thinking now a coding program would be really fun. We Mm. have Clovers Who Code is a curriculum that we have, um, or a robotics club. Those are also very popular. Learning that, like technology and engineering and all of that kind of stuff, is really important for kids because you can see the divide already between, you know, the, the... older generation and their ability to use smartphones versus the like two-year-olds that are like FaceTiming their aunts, (laughs) you know? So learning that technology so early, giving them a leg up for their future, whether or not they use it, they're not all going to become aerospace engineers or anything like that, but it's just giving them that hands-on experience that they can take further. Real quick as we wrap up, can you talk about um, your members and when you get them all together? I assume that you were running each program, but you've got volunteers running the program. How do you encourage them uh, to problem solve and to get along without getting involved? I think that's, that's hugely important in life, conflict resolution. Right. Um, so it's really about setting them up for success. So having them in a situation where that confrontation doesn't come up. And if it does, um, we really instill in our youth that we have mutual respect for each other and we hold each other accountable. So if, you know, somebody pushes somebody down or takes somebody's toy that they're playing with or something like that during something, then we encourage them to discuss what happened and apologize appropriately and meaningfully and understand the empathy that goes along with those kind of situations. Wow. 
That sounds like something we all need to work on, Rich. Uh, Absolutely. Okay, in the last uh, minute or so that we have, let's find out how folks can interact with you. Absolutely. Um, So the best way to contact us is through Facebook. We have um, all of our programs shared on Facebook. Um, So that's Wexford County 4-H on Facebook and Instagram. And then um, you can contact us at the MSU Extension office in Baker College. Um, Or you can shoot me an email. My email is kinga26 at msu.edu. I'm always happy to answer any questions. And we've all got clubs starting up soon. We've got our small animal clubs gearing up for the fair. All kinds of stuff going. Okay, everybody, get your kids involved and get them involved with 4-H. Kate King is the Wexford 4-H Program Coordinator. Thank you so much for your time and your boundless energy (laughs) that you're bringing to our kids. Thank you guys for having me again. Cadillac Unscripted, sponsored by Independent Bank. Join us next time, uh, next week, same time, same station on 1079 CDY.